Intersectionality is a conceptual lens to help us understand how life experiences are shaped by the interaction of different aspects of identity. Um, it was a term that was co uh, coined by the lawyer Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 um, to help us understand about the distinctive experience of a person who is, for example, a woman and is black compared to a person who is either a woman and all black. And intersectionality has been picked up because, in a way, it, it helps us understand the multiple identities that people navigate in their lives and the impact on them. Um, generally, intersectionality as a term um, really refers to the more socially constructed identity, identities, such as race and class and gender, sexuality, ethnicity and so on, that people navigate as they go through their lives and how they function reciprocally together to either open or constrain opportunities. So it isn't just about those elements of identity that um, cause discrimination, but also how certain combinations of identities can open opportunities for some people and close them down for others. Intersecting inequalities is a kind of another layer of this in that it, it's specifically about thinking about those combinations of identities um, that compound discrimination. So it includes those aspects of identity, that I've, the socially constructed aspects of identity, but also other different layers that might compound that discrimination. So, for instance, economic... Um, inequality caused by people living in a slum area or in a remote geographical area. Sorry, that's the other way around. The spatial is the um, people live where they live and how that compounds discrimination. And the economic is about livelihoods, insecure livelihoods, and the other <coughs> sorts of economic situations um, that, that also build on the pattern of discrimination. So... Why explore intersecting inequalities as drivers of poverty and marginalisation in this project? And why use intersectionality as a, as a theoretical lens? I mean, I guess, in all honesty, intersectionality is a kind of theoretical term <laughs> that we felt, on some level, um, would appeal to the funder. <laughs> um, in, in a sense, but also because it came out of the previous work we'd done and what we'd observed in our previous research about the kind of intersecting factors that are present amongst the most excluded communities. So, you know, currently intersectionality, which was originally a feminist methodology, is being applied as an analytical tool to help us un understand the complexity of real life inequalities and power and privilege, and also as a way to direct action for social justice. And I think it's fair to say that when we started with our partners um, <coughs> in our inception workshop, people were a little, a little like, well, what has this got to do with our lives, this very theoretical term? But I think as we've worked because we've been working through understanding people's real life experiences, it's made sense because people are living the consequences of intersecting inequalities in the difficulties they face. We'd also found in our previous participate work that marginalisation is perpetuated when intersecting inequalities are not addressed. And in all of our contexts, so we've got pictures from two contexts here, one in India and one in Ghana, we were working with participants who face multiple inequalities and were are tied together as five different contexts, very different contexts, by the severity of the inequality that they face and the entrenched nature of the inequality they face. So, for instance, in um, India... Our partner Praxis worked with um, denotified tribe, denotified and nomadic tribes, or, or what we they refer to as DNTs. And 
These are groups, communities, um, who were criminalised, are criminalised from birth. Um, they, they face a worse situation than the lowest castes in terms of their stigmatisation and, and, and the, the way they're pushed to the margins. Um, and they're criminalised in birth, from birth partly because of um, legislation during the British administration. Um, which criminalised them due to their activities. Basically, the, in some sense, they were unruly populations. They didn't stay where they were supposed to stay. They took part in activities like illegal liquor brewing that was not um, allowed. Um, it includes street performers, uh, traditional sex workers, forest dwellers who didn't stay in one place, and, and many, many different groups. And they are some of the most discriminated against communities in India, maybe worldwide. Um, and they share the experience of, for instance, being going to school and being told they're too stupid to learn or to sit at the back of the class. So it's no good in that, that sense if we're trying to address the sustainable de development goals to say we need to focus on education or health because for these people can't access those services because the consequences of their discrimination is not taken into account. Um, and, and this was true in all of the different contexts. So the other part of our picture, and what we've been doing is exploring pathways from understanding the realities of lives lived in a context of intersecting inequalities, to building collective action, building capacities and collective action, to um, those communities building more accountable relationships with outside agents, government, governance, state, NGOs, whatever, in order to address the problems they face. And we focus on accountable relationships, because in another way, that's the sticking point of participatory processes. Um, people living in poverty have identified the major problems caused by corrupt and unresponsive governance. Um, other research has shown that transparency initiatives, information and civic forums are not enough. Transformational change in, in these kind of relationships are needed. Um, and that means tackling the local and structural power dynamics that maintain exclusion. Um, at the same time, the kind of exclusionary dynamics that people face in very unaccountable contexts, and all of our contexts are very unaccountable, um, are enacted through face-to-face -face relationships, through people meeting each other and interacting. So that kind of provides the opportunity to potentially shift those relationships towards something new. So that provides the second focus for our research. Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. So... Great. My laptop decided to turn off as I'm starting. Um, so one of the main words that comes across the report is this idea of navigation and navigating tensions and navigating pathways, both to inclusion and towards accountability. So in a way why we ended up using this word so much is because it's really hard to determine a straight road or a straight set of steps that these partners have followed. In a way there is not, there, there's no blueprint and there is no like everyone has done these five steps, hence any social organization wanting to be more inclusive and promote accountability, follow these five steps. So that you won't find in our report, <laughs> sorry to tell you. Um, we looked at some of the elements that came across through this navigation of, of pathways 
And of course, the first one is that um, building this inclusion in contexts where people have been systematically for even uh, centuries um, discriminated against and excluded of processes from the community to the national level, it's not simple or, or quick, right? And often, um, once you are starting to evolve the process, people seem to be engaging and attending you know, the group meetings, whatever, but you cannot predict that, um, that once they've started, this is going to you know, explode and become a social movement and, and grow. People have re reservations, and we will explore in the next bits why these tensions can emerge and how we saw them playing out in different cases. It's also risky because in most of these contexts, uh, the main, the bottom line, which has already been mentioned both by Joe and Jackie, and that we've been working on in the participation team cluster for years, is shifting power dynamics. And of course, that is not taken well by anyone. No one wants to lose their power. No one wants to lose their privilege. So getting to a point where people are able to risk a bit of their um, personal or social uh, space and connections, it's also a, a, a big step, right? However, we did find, find that something that has proven helpful and rather um, empowering in, in a way is using creative, visual, and performative methods, which are not uh, focused on, let's say, uh, like knowledge that is completely based in data and numbers, but it's other sets of knowledge that are tapped into. And we have actually, for people who haven't heard about, there's a, a knowledge from the margins policy brief that we did and speaks a lot about that component of using and unearthing other, other types of um, knowledge which doesn't come from traditional research methods. So. This was very important in all cases to actually bond the groups and give them a space for in-depth discussion, both of their inequalities, which are not easy to talk about, but also talking about creating actions for change, you know, from a way that they feel comfortable doing so. And not all the groups felt comfortable to take in action, so that was another difficulty. And finally, as I said, we're going to look at some of the tensions and lessons that came from uh, building these pathways to inclusion and accountability. Uh, for that, I'm going to actually bring into the room virtually our, our partners in the five countries, and then you will also get a sense of, of, of the contexts where each of them were working. Um, hopefully this works okay. <laughs> I'm going to play the video, which I believe it's here. And at the end, well, note any questions that you have specifically about the video for the end, uh, because we won't be able to like pause it and answer, etc. So here we go. Is that all of them? No. So, so Kadiapik is, is working with post-conflict communities in the Teso and Karamoya subregions in northeastern Uganda. In Uganda, corruption and dysfunctional public structures drive marginalized people from accessing services. Attitude towards the youth, women, people with disabilities, people living with HIV and AIDS and the elderly make them more vulnerable, marginalized and excluded. The poorest, the poorest and most marginalized are very, very difficult to reach. So, so we ask the communities who is in a worse situation, situation than you, and we, and we involve them, them in bringing the marginalized people, people together. together. But the intrinsic tension was the differences between people makes it difficult to build collective action. So we, so we focused on common, common concerns to build shared, shared identities and group purpose. The lesson, the lesson is that it is important to have enough time, time to reach the most marginalized and, and help the groups to develop capacities to demand, demand what they need. They need.
via praxis, via praxis work, work with, with a group of demotified tribes, tribes who comprise, who comprise a prize of over 150 million living in India, in India. In the late, the late 1800s, 1800s, the British, the British tribal, tribal communities, communities as criminals criminal, because of the inclusivities and likelihoods that they pursue. Even though, Even though in the 50s, the, 50s, the Indian government, government demotified this group, there is stigma and discrimination of being born into the criminalized identity that the notified community face two key challenges. Criminal label is actually a socially reinforced label rather than a legal one. And the data, and the data generation model is created in multiple, sets, multiple of sets of categories. But because, but because there is isn't one for the notified tribes, 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 they're just excluded and not counted. We felt we for, for denotified tribes, tribes absence, of data, absence of data is the real problem. problem. And therefore, and therefore we, facilitated we facilitated communities to co-create narratives, generate, generate data in various forms. But we realized, but we realized these narratives were not accepted in mainstream, in mainstream spaces, spaces because of the, because of the deep-rooted prejudices against, against these communities. In Ghana, in Ghana, the Adan Adan women salt winners are deprived access to the Sambal Lagoon, Lagoon, which is the main, which is the main source of, of their, livelihood. their livelihood. This is the this failure, is the failure of, the of the traditional duty bearers, as the, the chiefs, to protect, to protect this, resource this resource for the whole, for the whole community. Radio Adan, radio Adan, a community, a community radio, radio stations, stations have collaborated with the chairman women, women to build their, their capacities to express, to express their, their concerns, to champion, to champion their, concerns, their concerns, to challenge, to challenge the, social the social norms, to take their, to take their place in decision. In decision. The, problem the problem is, is this has set up tensions between the women and some of the chiefs and some of the men who are involved in the private mining. So, so the group, the group has, responded has responded by using, by using songs and dance, and dance to, to lessen, lessen social, social tensions. tensions. And, the and the radio has helped, has helped to, legitimize to legitimize their concerns. Their concerns. We, we have learned, have learned how, to how to navigate local, local, local tensions. tensions. And we need, and we need now, now to use those approach. Those approach to build a dialogue, a dialogue with other duty bearers. People living, People living with HIV, HIV AIDS in Egypt are, are a hidden minority group that faces extreme stigma, extreme stigma and discrimination, which hinders which their active participation, active participation in establishing, establishing and maintaining accountable relationships with duty bearers, bearers, for example, healthcare service providers and policy and decision makers. Most of, Most of participants come from, come from lower social, social background, background. background. Increasing, increasing the vulnerability to discrimination, discrimination. Feeling the feeling unheard, the unheard lived experience, experience people, people living with HIV, HIV, HIV would have about, about becoming recognized. recognized. Therefore, we engage, we engage support, with support with trustworthy, trustworthy community, community, community members to record their stories. Urban thousands, thousands are most of the of our South Africans, but 84% of these doubts is unemployed. unemployed. We found, we found doubt that, doubt that, that residents are ignorant to the rights to access government services. services. There's a lack of sex spaces to meet, and the government doesn't come to come to our ground level to discuss anything with us. In our work, we experience an unexpected tension between holding accountable relationships and strongly, and strongly challenging, challenging duty bearers. We released, we released our film, Gangsters, Gangsters in Uniform, which is about which is police about corruption and brutality in Delft, without sensitizing, sensitizing the police about the purpose of the film. A key step, a key step to building accountability, accountability in Delft was a link, was a link with, the police, with the police, but we lost, but we lost that opportunity because the police, because the police took, offense took offense to the work. We learned that, we learned that it was important, it was important to think critically, to think critically not only, not about, only about planned, planned steps, steps that are needed, that are needed to, build to build accountability, but also, but to, also reflect to reflect and respond, and respond throughout the process, the process to navigate, to navigate what, happens. what happens. So, back to the presentations. Okay, so that's... Uh, quite short film that we used and presented in different policy roundtables and events that have happened throughout this year. And now we're going to pass on speaking about three main tensions that uh, we have decided to highlight 
uh, not to say these are the only three, and that in the report there will be more depth about this. Uh, we're going to run a bit because we want to end by 40, around uh, quarter to two, so there's some space for, for question and discussion. Um, so the first tension I will, I will talk about and mostly explain about these images here is that the people we are working with are living in these crossroads of multiple inequalities and opening this up generates various difficulties and these difficulties can be uh, some that are common to any participatory process which can be what I need is money, don't talk to me about all these political participation rights things. I need a source of livelihoods and give food to my children. Um, but that's kind of present often in any participatory research and programs that, that you can encounter and you might have encountered in your life. In particular here was um, a dynamic that was more linked about people coming together and actually being willing to talk about elements of their identity which are not socially accepted, for example, or that they've never spoken about in public fora. So, for example, in the case of the Yikachi women, which is the brave women of Ada, the first photo photograph in Ghana, um, uh, patriarchy is entrenched it is very hard to question male behavior. So Radio Ada has done a very uh, slow burning, let's say, process of uh, women themselves realizing the diverse inequalities that they are facing due to the patriarchy system that they live in. And of course, they, they don't use the word patriarchy or you know, feminism or any of this terminology but through different exercises and, and all these dance, drama, songs, reflections, workshops, they have managed, like women have uh, themselves noted a lot of injustices in the way that they've been treated just for the fact of being born women, right? And in addition to that, for example, within the group there has been some challenges, for example, um, you know, you are actually linked to the salt mining business, how can you be part of our group if you're not on it? So they have developed ways for talking about these difficulties and these tensions within the group. And so far they've managed to keep the group somehow united and still focused on the cause. Um, <clears throat> another key um, example on, of this happened in South Africa. Uh, I think in general we know of the racial tensions that exist in this country from apartheid and even before. But even in a group setting like the township of Delft in Cape Town, uh, these issues took a long time to be actually opened up and people identifying racial division and um, identity as a very a powerful element still of their discrimination because the mainstream government and all the policies post-apartheid have been focused on like we are the rainbow nation and you know no one gets discriminated anymore but of course that's not how it's lived in a day-to-day -day basis and most of these people the insecurity and the violence of the state they face is very much linked to their identities either for being black, for being from a very secluded uh, geographical area, or even having a particular sexual identity or preference. So these were issues that um, were not easy to discuss in other groups. What they didn't even get to the point to actually discussing them because people just couldn't. So it's just to say that it's a very, it's an important step to take, but it's a really, it was a very uh, difficult one generated tensions. So I'm going to give the next one. So as Erica has said, part of our research learning was in what the key tensions of this kind of work is and how they can be navigated in the different contexts, because obviously the different contexts require a different response. 
and a different way through the difficulties and round the blocks and constraints that there are in, in cha essentially challenging power in these circumstances. And a second tension, major tension that we found, was between building collective identity and shared common purpose and recognising the differences that perpetuate exclusion. And this is really important because it is necessary <coughs> to build collective identities, to resource collective action and leverage power to challenge things. Um, but at the same time, if in building the collective identity, um, a group neglects the differences between them, then some people in any circumstance will always be further marginalised. So that's a fundamental balance that people had to, the participants and their, the organisations had to work through in the different contexts. So for instance, um, I mentioned the, the DNT group before, they have an imposed criminal identity, but there has never really been a collective movement in the country. Um, to leverage any government response. And that's partly because, partly the groups want to remain hidden because they're so stigmatised, but also because they're very different. They don't particularly identify as being part of the same peoples, if you like. So they have very different livelihoods. I mentioned the forest dwellers, people doing traditional sex work, street performers, and so on. So early in the process, Praxis ran activities um, for people to find out and see what kind of experiences they, they shared. So they looked at, this is a picture of um, the doctors. So people, there were a number of um, charts of these kind of pictures, school, um, the doctors, the legal profession, so on. And people wrote the, the kind of experiences they'd had dealing with these service providers. And what they found that was that they shared a lot of experiences in the way they would talk to uh, and, and denied services when they went to these places. And that was really important in laying the foundation for working together. At the same time, it was really <coughs> tricky because um, they were, they are very different groups. And there was discrimination within the groups against each other. So, for instance, many of the groups um, had prejudiced views about um, the, the women in the groups like the Nats and the Badia and the Kanjar, who are traditionally involved in, in um, sex work, which is a modern form of bonded labour. Um, and, and they didn't really want to work with them necessarily. And, you know, the young people in that circumstance would discriminated against. There were lots of language difficulties. And um, also, the men were more vocal, as is often the case. So it required very careful and experienced facilitation to work through that. And it didn't happen in one step. It was progressive and iterative. And it's only really now that the campaign group as a whole, their work was linked to a national campaign has started looking at how to bring women into the, into the, the campaign movement. Um, similarly, in Egypt, it was only through doing the work to look at the kind of differences between people um, that, that explained why it was harder for some to get services than all others, um, given that this is a very stigmatised group. And there's a, as, as people are aware, I'm sure, the closing of civic space... Uh, is quite extreme in Egypt, so it's very difficult for people to speak out. And in many cases, even people's own families didn't know they were HIV positive. So coming out and talking publicly is very difficult. And then there was discrimination within the group um, between, you know, the, 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 those men who contracted HIV through having sex with other men were more stigmatised within the group themselves than those who um, got HIV um, through blood transfusion. And, um, and women, HIV women, are largely invisible. So building collective 
collective, uh, collective identity is important, but it's really important to understand those differences between people. And it was really hard in this context um, where people couldn't be seen or speak out to bring those, these kind of issues out in the, in the public realm. Thanks, Jackie. So the third tension <clears throat> is what maybe we didn't um, mention is that the analysis that we've done here is based in a collective analysis that we did with our partners. And so they came together and brought all their data, all their experiences, and we spent an awfully long time, very intense conversations, bringing this data together, trying to make sense of it, both within each setting and across the groups. And we ended up with a big diagram which had a lot going on, had kind of layers. And the bottom layer was about these processes that Erica started talking about, about the internal processes, um, working with the groups, how you manage to surface and express <coughs> and communicate and actually speak out about experiences of oppression and so on. And then the group processes, the group building, and how there'd been a lot of work and gone on over this period of time. For some, it had been years that they'd been working with these groups. Others, it was a, a relatively shorter time. And that, that a lot had gone on at that level and had been very effective. Where they were finding it challenging was this other level. They drew this other kind of layer where there was much less going on and was really challenging. It's about how you get those processes to connect with decision makers. What are the opportunities and often there are more barriers than opportunities, and there was a lot of frustration. That huge amount of work had gone into, and perhaps at local level, reaching out to local government, particular, kind of, especially ward level, village level uh, leaders who were very sympathetic or could be brought into those processes, but then uh, it was often challenging to get beyond. What we did find um, is that certain methods were very effective. Um, which many of, many of you in this room already know and use them, but that participatory methods, especially embodied participatory methods, were very effective in communicating issues, in um, bringing together people and, and uh, giving them access to those, the experiences of these groups in public settings. So the picture on the left is of a community theatre group who are playing out the stories of the marginalised groups that Sokoja Pick has had been working with. And the, um, they came together and told their stories and constructed a narrative that they wanted to tell into that public forum that the, that the, the theatre group then uh, enacted for them. So they, had, they were able to speak with a microphone and tell their stories, but also they were, they were played out, which is a very effective way of engaging other community members and challenging stigma and stereotypes around women, people living with HIV, AIDS, and so on, and also of engaging with policymakers. So these methods have been really important, both in that challenging of the stigma and having people look at people in a different way, um, both community members and, and decision makers. And we had local government, um, the different levels of local government in Uganda coming to these and being really interested and were getting out and people from other wards and districts saying, can't you come and do this where we are as well? We, we think it's really effective. But of course, national government didn't engage with these. And in the end, it's national government that's going to uh, decentralise or not decentralise the resources that these communities desperately need. The other case, um, the other photo is from South Africa, and you saw it in the longer film that we showed. And... There, the issue was more that you couldn't engage at the very local level because of the corruption and the, the kind of synergy, if you like, or, um, uh, of the uh, gangs and the police within the township. And so challenging that was extremely risky. And there were, were lots of cases of um, aggression and very frightening experiences for the people who were working in the, the Delft Safety Group. What they did was to start to engage at city and province and even national level. They had a, a couple of opportunities to engage at national level. And so that was another key piece of, of learning, that in some situations you can't build those local relationships because they're too risky and you need to find allies in other spaces. And key to that was um, often, at, at least in the setting, in the way that we've been working, the, the inter 
the, what we call kind of ended up calling translocutor, but the organisations that worked as kind of intermediaries between very marginalised groups and duty bearers and helped to open up spaces, facilitate connections so that they could still be the ones to, to speak the message if they felt safe to do that or if they had built up enough capacity and communication skills to do that. But the, but the, the um, interlocutor organisations were able to facilitate those things. Um, so, I've already talked through that one, really. Um, what we did find, though, and then a challenge to all of us at the end, was um, reflection from one of our partners, who said that a gap in the pathway to accountability is transforming the powerful, whose vested interests are perpetu perpetuating inequalities for the most marginalised. And this is something that Robert always comes back to, that we spend a lot of work, a lot of time, at least in our sector, working with marginalised groups, supporting processes that build their capacities, build their voice, and then how often are we working with duty bearers, with the powerful, to change the way they think, to change their behaviours, and how can we be doing that? And are we going about it the right way? And it's, yeah, so um, I think that quote speaks powerfully for itself. And another, um, maybe another just other message to leave you with is the, the issue of missing actors that came from Egypt, that you can have... There is a kind of accountability ecosystem we talk about sometimes. There are a lot of players in this picture in order to make the flow happen so that, that there is accountability to, to marginalised groups. And sometimes some actors just can't... Um, it's important <coughs> to find out who those actors are, who you need to engage with and make sure that they're in the picture. Um, more, of course, a lot more is in the report that we'd like to invite you to go and have a look at <laughs> if you follow that link. And I was just going to leave you with, if I can, there we are. So that's again pictures from our partners' work. Um, and so we invite you to download the report and have a look at it and get back to us with questions, reflections, when you can. So um, I'll leave it there. I'm, I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you very much. that are hidden or marginalised or cannot be said 
into the public arena. But that's not about going in and making a video and putting it on YouTube. It's about thinking very carefully about whether that's ethically appropriate and in what circumstances and how you navigate that to do that in a way that, that's safe and provides the necessarily support to people. And, you know, some of coming together in a group with other people who share experiences can be a really important way of making connections and moving on and building agency and so on and so forth. But one of our major messages really from this is this can't happen quickly and you can't make the assumption therefore that what is done is going to be seen by other people. It might be about doing things to generate internal discussion and for me part of ethical practice is very much you may be using video but the, it shouldn't be an assumption that people are going to see that video. It may be just a, as a resource to think and reflect back to the group themselves. It may not go any further. Um, so, in a way, part of our work has been exploring how to do this kind of work ethically. And in some cases, that's been about the partners supporting the people they work with the de with the decision not to go public, if you like. So, for instance, uh, in a previous iteration of Participate, the Egypt group would, worked with children um, with HIV. Um, and that was really ethically complex because it was a really important issue, but many of the children didn't even know they were HIV positive. Um, so they did do some visual work, but um, in this project they decided to work with adults. Um, but at the same time, you have to be careful therefore that that knowledge isn't lost. So they did do some work where they used um, um, digital storytelling to tell some of those stories without any of the people who you know, you're participants being involved. So it's, it's ethics is at the heart for me in how you navigate these things. And it's not necessarily simple, as we said. So it's about understanding those risks. Absolutely. And Jackie is an ethics convener as well. <laughs> so it gives it a lot of thought. <laughs> It was only possible to do this 
because it's building on long-term relationships. The kind of work we do isn't about diving in, working with people for a bit and going out. We have partners in 30 countries who have long-term relationships with the kind of people we're talking. So we're only able to do this because it builds on previous work. So while this bit is a short bit of funding, the plan is that we continue to support the groups in the participate network. So sorry. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. There is one joke. Yes. So, um, uh, which also plays into the ethics question as well, because they are embedded partners who are who have a sense of, of a, a, a long-term sense of responsibility towards the people they work with, rather than oh, we've come run in, done this, and run off again, and left you exposing all your your stigmatised identities for people to then prey more on. Um, um, so the case in Uganda was that um, in fact, the newest to newest to the project, um, but did a huge amount. And what they found, I think, because very little had been done in, in around accountability in, in this part in Teso in um, northeastern Uganda, and so it was ripe. And what they discovered is they went and they introduced themselves to, to to local government so because you have to do that in order to have access and be be okay for you to work there. But what they realised gradually is that the local, the elected, local elected politicians didn't know what they they had no training. And so they were really eager to find out what is it that we can do in order to do our jobs better. We're not just trying to, we're not just resource seeking, rent seeking, we're actually, you know, can you support us? And so, and so, so to pick ended up doing um, training for local, uh, local elected uh, representatives. So that, that could be, you know, somewhere we could start looking really interesting. And thinking about that diagram, so there's so much going on at that kind of at the heart of it, the individual the group, but how could we be looking at cases where there have been connections, where these organizations and processes haven't managed to shift something and talk to those people? And I, th I think this was, although a short time and needs more work, it was part of the focus. And I mentioned briefly that uh, the DNT group, the, the, the research process there was linked to a campaign and that was a new strategy for Praxis um, to build relationships between, uh, there was a, the, the part of the government department on DNTs which has now been disbanded, there was a, a link between them to try and, you know, provide information for those in a, a kind of marginalised department of the government to give them some materials to work with. So, you know, it's, it's kind of multi-level, just not for long, as long as we'd like it. So there's a lot, lots to build on, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's a quick question, really, about how you break down intersectionality. Because I was thinking, I mean, you're talking quite big categories like women or men or um, yeah, people who are disabled or not. And I was thinking about some of the work that we've been doing on child labour where you take say, a family of uh, people involved in labour might be one form of discrimination. Um, the, eldest, the eldest male child would be another. So it's not just the male child, it's also the eldest male mm -hmm. child. Because the eldest male child is the one that often gets sent to the middleman to go off and work with X, Y, and Z, you know, efficiency jobs or whatever that's him the level. So I'm just wondering how micro you go in terms of breaking down these categorizations. And then if you end up going too micro, in effect you're ending up saying everyone's different. And we need to look at all of their different um, discriminations. Yeah. And how do you handle that in terms of an analysis? Thanks, Sonny. Um, I'll just quick start. So how we how we break it down intersectionality and which intersections are we interested in? Are we, you know, these are the five important ones, but yeah. Well in Uganda actually the government has identified five vulnerable categories, which were the five that, that the local partner then was working with, because they, they those are the ones that have been identified by government. So that is women, elderly, youth people living with HIV, HIV AIDS and people living with people with disabilities. But that was a kind of, that made it into an opportunity that they could 
then get some leverage around that there was a kind of political support, to, um, policy support for them to work those groups. But then the other piece of the, I, of the jig, sorry, and so they were very obvious. You can hear which groups are not there, and so you, maybe you can't work with it anyway. So very glaring absences there in terms of the groups that are persecuted or stigmatised. Um, but I think something that was really important in, in this work was the, the, the time and thought about what, what works in this context. So I think the eldest child in certain <coughs> contexts in poverty is more likely to go into slavery in certain contexts. In other contexts, the youngest girl may be. So what are the, what are the contextual factors that are playing out? And we're not interested in the categories per se, we're interested in what drive, what combination of factors is driving those groups and those, those individuals, those families, those communities, even when it's a very, a very extreme spatial um, uh, marginalisation that's important there. And, and you know, part of the work <coughs> is about understanding those differences, exploding those categories if you like, but not just to generate more and more categories, but to understand what happens if you don't think about difference. At the same time, navigating that tension I mentioned before between understanding difference and maybe opening it up when it's painful, and whether that's ethical to do it and when and where, and building a sense of unity as well. So that is the that is the a core challenge that we've been facing. Yeah, and I'm actually said it's two o'clock and, and have to get off, some people have to get off to things. If you do, please feel free to leave. If you want to stay and ask more questions or discuss further, please feel free to do so. We're here. And, and nothing has come through Facebook, right? Um? Through the Facebook? Did it? Did something come? Yes. Questions? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. But those questions did. Yeah. So we're, we're still live now. We're still live now at the moment. We're still live. So, so we can take some I can questions. stop. Yeah, take questions. Yeah. Okay. But nothing came for the chat. What? The seminar? Oh. Like we're still, we're still broken. Oh, no, no, no. So we don't have any questions no. online to Coming from the online yeah. audience. Still so I just wanted to ask about uh, intersecting inequality. As <coughs> Jake was saying, that uh, it's, sorry, it's intersecting inequality, as Jake was saying, it's like uh, inequalities which is combined with economic conditions, poverty, and Intersecting inequalities includes any aspect of people's circumstance and identity that, that um, compounds discrimination, if you like, and inequality. So some of that is the big social identity categories, but some of those identities are not included, like the criminalised identity or the uh, imposed identity of certain people in certain cities. Situations. But also some of the spatial identities, the, the economic identities as well, are <coughs> part of the, the, the complex picture. So my question was uh, in, uh, regarding this, uh, how, for example, you, have, you, you said you have local problems, uh, you whom you are working with in the countries. Uh, I, I, I know that these inequalities are always like, related to poverty, but I think there is a Relationship, for example, disability and poverty, and HIV people are always really discriminated against in the environment as well. So, are these are these partners also giving their, for example, for example vocational skills or either discrimination in employment or kind of any uh, other than like participatory methods we are using? Are, are they giving anything like vocational skills? So it depends on the partner. And yeah, do you want to say about the partners? Hopefully, hopefully. <coughs> maybe not. <coughs> well, there, this is what it's the challenge, like between participatory organizations and service delivery organizations or assistentialist approach to organizations, because some of these groups might have started, for example, working more on the informal economy, like I know SLF in Cape Town. They were so focused on mapping the economic activity and trying to look at micro enterprises. So well, that's why the name is Sustainable Livelihoods Foundation because it's about gen income generating initially. But then it comes to a point where after I don't know any years, number of years working, you realize that 
it's not about generating income, but the, the inequality is perpetrated a lot more because of the lack of access to rights and the entrenched violence that even the state suits to the citizens that they don't give any appropriate uh, services or there's not even electricity or water or how can you run a business in those conditions, etc. Right? So they've shifted to doing more work on the rights approach, let's say, to, to change and to development. But then again, the people are still in need of jobs. So they need to go out, and especially the young people who participated in this group, they ended up you know, leaving the project or you know, stopping the meetings because they had to take jobs and get money from somewhere. So this is part of the exact tensions that even though that the partners, some can give certain support either in skills or, you know, yigachime, they don't need skills. They have the skills for salt winning and they have had money coming in through that. But the fact that now it's being privatized and taken and grabbed and all of this is what, what's leaving them uh, more impoverished, you know? So it's a way of like, um, not that they don't recognize that people need this like money and <laughs> And the livelihood, but that at the end, this was this have for none of these groups, this is enough mm -hmm. to be out of this, of this that circle of like um, poverty, inequality, discrimination. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Um, thinking more about the organization Ghana and uh, several of the organizations, in fact, that their focus is more on what micro community development processes and communication, so maybe through community radio, but very much about building capacities to um, communicate issues and to demand accountability, so they wouldn't see themselves as, while they would recognize those, those, those limitations or those, those challenges, they, that that's not what they're there for. And, but also because they, they're committed to long-term community development processes, they, they stay there, they're embedded, their local organisations, so they have that um, uh, capacity to, um, they can offer that long-term support, I guess. And I guess, you know, in each context is different, but it's not like the partner organisations are saying, well, we need to focus on, you know, violence and police corruption in Delft. That is the most pressing issue, so the whole process is about what matters in that context the most, and that's the starting point. So other things may follow, mm -hmm. but it's not, you know, the whole thing doesn't happen from a service delivery point of view. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Jamie. Why haven't seen the same issues? What do you think? Does it resonate with you? Yeah, no, I'd be interested to know across the five projects, my understanding is that you brought everyone together to assess the commonality. And I wondered what were the what ones were common across which surprised you, and perhaps which ones weren't common at all, which you assumed would be common. So remember, some of the commonalities were not in issues, but in the kind of tensions that okay. the aspects of the process okay. and what we learned about mm. the tensions associated with this. So those three tensions you presented are the commonalities found yeah. across. Um, but also, if you think yeah. about commonalities about what is driving people. Like people's situation of inequality, for example. Yeah. I think that it was quite interesting. Like you can, because for example, Egypt and South Africa was the quite urban, urban, peri urban, and um, and Uganda and Ghana, very rural and still very, uh, let's say, traditional. You know, the tra the dressing and the songs and the way, let's say, more traditional rural society. But I think definitely the gender inequality and that came super strong. I mean, everyone talked about how, yes, but for women it's even worse. You know, women have it like twice as hard, you know. And, um, and that, you know, women in, in Ghana were like, is that the same in other countries where this is happening? You know, like they wanted to know, is it like women are suffering the same as we are? And then you're like, well, yes, I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, 
Yes, in South Africa also women experiences like those digital stories made by, by women about how they've encountered insecurity are super sad, super tough and violent, right? So perhaps income wise they seem better off and slightly more educated, but they're still very like women are still heavily, you know, discriminated against in all the contexts. Another one that I think was quite powerful is that they realized that this issue of um, you know being treated wrongly because of um, an identity I don't know how to explain it well but it's like people believe that they they have this internalized stigma you know that they think that in a way they either did something wrong like sin or you know that's kind of their place in society to be you know, and that was very common that people, like, they, the partners identified breaking that personal, uh, let's say, lack of self-confidence and, and self-blame, self-blame, they found it across all of these people. They initially said, oh, it's, it's because I'm poor, I deserve this, because I am from this clan, the lower rank, I deserve this, because I am mm -hmm. a black, Mixed or a mixed race of African outborn out of this mm -hmm. family context, I deserve this life. And that was another very strong one that it's really hard to break. And and only partners who are not there only for like service provision, I think, can tap into this very kind of psychosocial dimension. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It was very interesting for me. I'd say something that was um, noticeably different was. Um, but maybe, well, I kind of think that these things are always obvious when you think about them afterwards, but um, um, the different spaces of uh, political opportunity, if you like, or civil, uh, civic space, but room for manoeuvre for the interlocutor organisations, that was quite different in different settings. So how they had to navigate <coughs> trying to open up space for accountability was quite different. They had to operate differently. Um, and even though some of the commonalities were about yeah. The corrupt circumstances, if you like, the way that was navigated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it ranged from Uganda being quite open to South Africa actually like targeting one of the activists and going into her home, and you know, so it was a huge difference of mm -hmm. yeah, of links to the powerful. And I think something that was very striking looking across was the courage of the people that were mm -hmm. participated. And you think, okay, we're inviting people, but we're not inviting to take risks. We're there to accompany people in a kind of process and to try and draw out learning from that. But the, as in their processes, how they were prepared and how they reflected together and decided to take risks was, they were hugely courageous. And I think that was. You know, something that stands out to me now looking back at it um, as a common factor and very um, yeah, powerful. Mm -hmm. And some of the other commonalities was about the elements of the process. So the elements of the process, the external group building and capacity building processes, the collective action, the, the engaging in external spaces. We in the report we've drawn out some commonalities within that. Now how that played out and the order of that was different in the different contexts, but there were commonalities, important parts of the process that were identified across the context. Okay. Have we run out of questions? Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you.